Welcome to Smart Film Photography. My name is Danny K. Johnson. I'm with Uvic Library's McPherson Library Digital Scholarship Commons. Today we're going to go over a review of some key principles and terms in photography and go through an explanation of some various examples and then go through some practice exercises in the lesson plan. The first thing that you need to do when you're learning about photography is to get to know light. The more you understand light, the stronger your photography will be. If you spend time around avid photographers, you'll hear phrases like, look at that light, or we were chasing light that evening. And photographers will often talk about the quality of light. Um, in this photo, you'll see um, a portrait of a young person who is sitting in a chair, and in the background, it's actually some dark wood paneling and she's sitting by a window and there's some indirect light hitting her face and what the photographer has done here um, is tapped on the screen where her face is to focus there and then what happens is because the camera sensor thinks that um, with all the darkness with her dark skin and the dark wood thinks that there's not enough light there so it overexposed everything so by dragging the exposure slider down and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes it dropped everything down until um, her face was properly exposed which dropped all the shadows down into darkness and then um, and then process the photo in black and white and then what we have here is in what photographers call a low key um, a low key portrait and uh, it ends up being um, very emotive and lovely and, uh, and that's how you get a, a portrait like this. Some people call photography painting with light. Light has a variety of colors and the type of light hitting your subject will change the tones of your photo. So an example of this um, can be seen in fluorescent lighting. Um, if you look at particularly older fluorescent lighting was known for its green tones. If you look at old photos of, um, you know, like gyms or old community halls, you can see how everybody's skin often has a sickly green tinge to them. And that's usually um, old fluorescent lights. They've gotten a lot better in modern times. You can get more expensive or higher end modern fluorescent lights that have more like they're called daylight fluorescence, and uh, those are a lot better, but fluorescents tend to have more of a, of a greener tinge to them. Um, tungsten lights are often, um, uh, especially, you know, those are getting phased out because of the energy that they consume, but those are usually used in lamps. And again, in older style lamp lights, you can see, and if you look at old photos around the house, you can see that sort of orange tone in photos. Shade light is usually sort of blue tones going into purples. Sunlight, as we know, has a nice warm tone to it. At sunset, you can see the light outdoors is rapidly changing from a soft golden hue to a rich golden orange, and photographers call this the golden hour. And then a, it changes to a blue tone, which is just after the sun sets, and this is called the blue hour. And light can change color if it's filtering through something such as a red patio umbrella or bouncing off an object before hitting your subject, such as a green wall. So if you have somebody standing next to a green wall, it bounces off that and hits you know, somebody's face, they're gonna be green on that side. And too many light sources can result in mixed lighting, which is usually unflattering. So if this is an example of mixed lighting versus single source lighting. So, I'll just turn on my pointer here. You can see in this example here that if you look closely, there is what we've got going on here is that the overhead light in the kitchen is turned on. And if you look closely, you can see this orange tinge here, and that is from the overhead light. And there's also a window just up here that is shining in, and it's got shade light coming in, and you can see blue here from that shade light and uh, what's also happening is that this tray of strawberries is sitting on it's 
um, cropped out, but it's a large old baking sheet that is dark. The sensor, which is just guessing the situation here, sees all this darkness and thinks, oh, we're in a dark space. So I need to bump up the light to deal with all this darkness. So it overexposes things. And you can see the edge of this tray here is overexposed. And in photography terms, this is known as blown out. So all the details are lost. You can see that the, the tray is kind of this, uh, you can see again, the sort of orangey tones here. It's too light. Um, the pixels are gone in here from the, the blown out highlights. The uh, strawberries look a little bit sickly. It's kind of, I mean, your brain can look at this and be like, strawberries are delicious, and you can override that a bit, but overall, it's it's not the most appetizing photo. So the difference in this here is nothing's been moved, but what has happened is that uh, all we've done is we've turned off the overhead light, so there's only one light source, which is the gentle, indirect light coming in from the window, and uh, so there's no mixed lighting happening. The photographer um, has just which is me, it's just tapped on the strawberries to focus and uh, overridden the sensor by just dragging the exposure down a little bit to have them properly exposed so we don't have things blown out and overexposed anymore. And you can see that the light is now even instead of coming from mixed colors, it's just even across there. And by just making that one, um, one or two subtle change in the uh, taking of this shot, the strawberries now look rich and succulent and uh, very tasty. And you have a more accurate photo of this richly colored fruit. It just took a couple of seconds and uh, you have a much better photo. And that's, uh, that's all really you have to do. Again, about the sensor being easily tricked. The sensor is just looking at the scene and trying to guess the lighting conditions. In this case, it sees the dark pavement. It doesn't realize the pavement's supposed to be dark. It thinks it's a dark room, so it turns the exposure up. You can see that here. Uh, the image, as the sensor thinks it should be, the it might look acceptable from a distance, but if you look at it closely, it's not great. You can notice how the leaves have blown out highlights here, and uh, the shoes um, have no details left in them. And uh, this doesn't give us much freedom for editing and it might pose issues if we ever wanted to print the image. If the leaf was a face, you would meet, be missing details in the skin. The center image is, uh, all that's been done is that we've dragged the exposure down to make sure that the leaves are po properly exposed and truer to life. And the image here on the right is the final image that's been post-processed with some minor editing to add some richness back into the color from the bits of the low afternoon sun that was hitting the leaves. And here's a close-up here. So you can see how the uh, highlights have been blown out and in here. And this is the final image here. So again, if you imagine this as being a face, you would want those skin tones and details kept within the photo as opposed to this, where if you could imagine this being someone's nose or cheek, where you would lose that. And this is just having control over your image. This is a great example of a case where the brag of hashtag no filter would be no brag at all. The sensor took one look at this golden grass and guessed wrong and sucked all the lovely color out of it. This is what the grass actually looked like. And this is what the sensor thought the grass should look like. So this is just me pointing the camera at the grass and taking a photo straight out of camera. And it took a look at it and thought, oh, that's that can't be real. So we're just gonna suck all the color out of it and take the photo. Um, the second image hasn't been processed at all. There's no filter on it or anything. This is just simply um, using a function called white balance to adjust the photo while I was taking it and getting it truer to life um, to make sure it matched reality. And there is a white balance activity in the lesson plan that shows you how to do that using an app. So many people think that bright sunny days are the best for photos because they love sunny days the best, but a good mood doesn't equal good photos all the time. 
Harsh overhead light can cause a lot of problems for photos, not just because of squinting, but particularly because of the strong shadows that are cast. Bright sunlight can also reflect off of plants and objects, le leaving your landscape photos looking pale and washed out. And this is why things can look more colorful in photos on an overcast day. Some smartphone photos or some smartphone cameras and apps will try to compensate for this by using a mode called HDR. And uh, this mode takes several photos in quick succession in a variety of exposures across a range and then averages them out to make one photo. And this can get you a decent approximation sometimes and rescue what would have been a failed photo. This also takes control away from you as the photographer. And it's great in a pinch, but it doesn't help you learn to improve your technique. Also, this can cause huge problems with blur if your subjects are moving at all. So it's not great for sports photography or portraits or anything like that. It can be really helpful in landscapes, but uh, it's not good to have turned on as a default. It's something that uh, in the take back control activity, I have you turn off and it's good to turn on manually in certain circumstances, but generally, um, personally, I have it turned off. Um, as a rule. So if we compare these images. The, uh, the first one in both of these sets were probably taken at high noon. Um, these are not taken by me. I found them online um, on Unsplash, but uh, they're probably taken at noon with a direct overhead light and this creates dark shadows obscuring the subject's eyes in particular. And if we tried to increase the exposure and in post-processing, what would happen is uh, if we were even able to get their eyes back, um, their cheeks would be blown out and probably the tops of their foreheads. And uh, we would lose that, those details and, you know, and the, on their shoulders and everything here too. The second photos in both batches were either taken in the shade or indoors near a photo with indirect and diffused light. And the softer light is even across their faces and we're able to see their eyes and expressions. And as an added bonus, there are some reflections of light that comes in from behind the photographer and uh, they're bouncing into their eyes. And you can see that those little reflections in their eyes and these are called catch lights and they bring an added sense of life to the subject's eyes. So when you're trying to communicate with your photography, it's helpful to start developing an eye and this goes beyond when you're just taking snapshots. Um, but when you're practicing your photography, ask yourself, what are you trying to convey? And um, how are you seeing the world around you? What are you trying to communicate? What stories are you trying to say? And even little decisions, subtle decisions can change the mood of each story told in each image. Make sure you get used to moving around and looking at things from different angles. It can be really easy to get into the habit of looking at things always from the same angle, standing up, pointing at things from the same point of view, and uh, getting up and moving around, laying down on the ground, standing up on a ladder, whatever that means. Try moving around and seeing things from um, up above, down below, it'll change your perspective and give you more creative images. This is just a beverage sitting on an old cookie sheet on a stove top by a kitchen window in the afternoon with indirect light. And by simply taking the photo from different angles, you end up with very different images. So when a photo doesn't express what we mean it to, we need to rethink it. This was a enormous leaf in Hawaii and I was out taking a walk and I was impressed by the size of it and I took a photo of it and was by myself and I realized the photo didn't capture just how large it was and I didn't have anything with me or anyone with me to stand next to it um, so I was trying to think how to convey just how large it was and I eventually thought to take a picture with my hand next to the leaf. And uh, also to give you an idea of how large this photo is, um, if you see these three holes right here, these are the same three holes next to my hand here. It's, it's a huge leaf. 
So when you're taking a photo and it doesn't tell the story that you mean it to, step back and rethink it. And don't be afraid to take multiple photos of the same thing until you get the result that you're looking for. Move your feet and rethink it and reframe it. This is an example of a photo that employs the rule of thirds in a couple of different ways. And uh, it really took me longer to wrestle the wobbly pairs into a line than it did to take the photo and process it and share it online. And so what we have going on here is a chalkboard wall and a dark table and a line of pairs. And so I arranged them in a gradient of color. So we've got the rule of thirds here. So we've got a grid of the three lines. And so the, the sort of horizon line, if you will, is uh, right along that one line here. And then if we've got the, the other two lines here, the pair that breaks the line is right along that intersection there. So we've got that point right here. If we allowed the sensor to guess what was going on here, the these lighter pairs here would have been completely blown out because the sensor would have thought there wasn't enough light in this room to expose this photo because of all the darkness. So I tapped on the pairs to focus them, dragged down the exposure until things were properly lit, and then snapped the photo. Um, something that I'll point out about this image is that the smartphone being used here was either an old iPhone 4S or 5S. One of the reasons I use this photo is to prove that you don't have to have the latest gear to take a beautiful image. Um, not only was this taken as a uh, with a very old iPhone, but this was a this is a screenshot off of Instagram because um, I didn't find the original photo in time to put together the slideshow. So uh, really, you don't have to chase after the latest gear and use the latest of everything in order to take something beautiful. And uh, so I just want to encourage you, if you don't feel like you have the latest phone, you can still take really beautiful images. So this example is to prove that you don't need a fancy studio to take or a fancy camera to take really nice images of things. All that's going on here is uh, we've got this is a dress hung up with some fridge magnets on my fridge on a very dirty stovetop um, using an overturned baking sheet. Um, yes, I use baking sheets a lot. <laughs> this is a window um, out into a backyard in shade. So we've got some indirect light coming in. And uh, all that was done to take this photo was, again, we tapped on the bottle to get it into focus. And again, because the there's a dark background, the camera sensor thought that there's it's in a dark room. So it wanted to overexpose the bottle. So drag down the exposure and snap the photo. Now, because I personally like to have dark backgrounds, um, I'm often dragging down exposure. If you are taking photos of something with a light background, if this if I'd left it with the white fridge in the background, the sensor would have thought, oh, we're in a very bright room, so we need to lower the exposure and things would have been too dark. So we would have just done the same thing, tapped on the bottle to focus it, and we would have needed to probably drag up the exposure. So if you wanted to take a photo of something with a white backdrop, you might need to bring up the exposure. And there is a bonus activity in the lesson plan that talks about um, how to set up a mini studio like this. And there are instructions for that in there. But the nice thing about this is we've got um, even using something as mundane as a black piece of fabric, in this case, a dress, and uh, you can use a, a shirt or just a piece of scrap fabric or even um, a sheet of poster paper, as long as it's not, you don't want it to be reflective. That's why fabric was nice for this. Just a, a baking sheet, which because of years and years of use, um, it ends up looking like a it's like an, an, an industrial floor or something like that. Um, you don't want light hitting the backdrop. You just want light hitting 
the object that you're taking a photo of. This has been post-processed to make sure that the color of the liquid in the bottle matches what it's supposed to look like. And it took just a couple of minutes to take this photo. An important thing to note is that digital zoom on smartphones is very low quality and will just result in a loss of detail. It, uh, it just fills gaps in between the pixels and it's, it is so much better to take the photo as is and crop it afterwards. Um, if you are, have one of those cameras that has more than one lens in your smartphone, you can have something that's called optical zoom and you might have a zoom lens on your smartphone and you can use that to zoom, but don't, um, don't use the digital zoom where you pinch and drag to zoom in because it'll just result in a loss of detail and it's much better to take the photo and, and crop it after. Um, this is an example of a couple of different things going on here. Um, I loved the moment that was happening in this photo but there's a lot of distracting clutter going on. There's all this junk on the table here. There's a bright dress and there's all sorts of different details in the background. So what I did was I cropped down to the action happening here, uh, converted it into black and white to get rid of excess distraction. Um, there's also this nice little frame that's created by the light that's hitting the wall in the background. And uh, one of the pre-workshop videos talks a bit about leading lines. And this line that's created by that light that's cast in the back draws the eye down to this puppy and the arms here, which is really nice. And you end up with this snapshot that's just um, elevated a bit into this nice little moment. Photos don't need to have unusual subjects or locations to be interesting. Um, the image on the left is simply a leaf on a plant in my front yard that I noticed when I was coming home one day. Um, as usual, I tapped on the leaf to focus it, drag down the exposure so that it was properly exposed, which dropped the background into shadow. Um, it took me seconds to take this photo and became one of my most popular ones that I've had a couple people ask to have printed. For their homes. Um, it's such a simple photo and um, I love it a lot. Um, the one on the right, a lot of people who live in Victoria will recognize where that's from and I just thought it was an interesting combination of lines and shadows and light and it's just a simple moment in a place I've been quite a few times. Editing photos, post-processing photos is not cheating. Um, people have been editing photos since the days of um, film. That's what happened in what they called dark rooms where they sat with chemicals and trays with, uh, with film um, negatives. People did all sorts of special effects with, uh, with those negatives, and uh, we just do that with software now, and it is all sorts of fun. And uh, the thing is, is just do things intentionally. And uh, sometimes when you take something straight out of the camera, it's dull, and the sensor is, just doesn't know what it's doing. It's just doing guesswork. And sometimes you have to edit the photos to get them to look as bright as real life. Um, one problem with filters in apps like Instagram or ViscoCam is that uh, popular apps just usually have a few free filters and millions of people are using the same filters for all the, fo all the photos. So there's um, there can be a wash of sameness across everything. So, you know, and there's this tendency to take the same photos of everything. So don't copy the influencers, be yourself. Copying can be a great way to learn. So there's no... There's nothing wrong with that. That's a really good way to practice, but ultimately strive to be yourself. The best choice is to make individual adjustments to your photos as needed. So as you're working through that, learn what each of those sliders in the, the settings and those adjustments mean. And there's an activity that goes through and explains what all those things do. Um, the best choice is to 
make those individual adjustments and see what they do and take them to the extreme and then bring them back down again and see what happens and be cautious going too far can have unintended effects that can um, destroy the photos think of it as seasoning you know you need salt to make a dish tasty when you're cooking but too much can destroy the flavor speaking of food when the color temperature is causing problems with your photos, you can usually fix it with post-processing and some apps will allow adjustments before even taking the photo, as I mentioned before. These first images show the yellowing caused by tungsten light bulbs in the room where the photos were taken. So you can see the yellow on the plates and on the food. Unlike the previous examples with the grass, these photos were fixed after they were taken and corrected with an app. And it's amazing how much more appealing something can look when a simple adjustment is made. I mean, you can look at this and say, you know, cupcakes are delicious, but how much more tasty do they look when they are just simply corrected by making the color accurate to real life? So barrel distortion is created because lenses are curved and the more curved they are, the more apparent barrel distortion is. Um, you notice this the most if with something um, called fisheye lenses. If you've ever been in a hotel where you've looked through the people in a door, you can really see something that's you know super curved and people's faces are distorted. On a smartphone, um, because the lenses are so tiny and they're meant to have a wide angle lens, you can really see barrel distortion when you're looking at something that's close up. Um, and uh, barrel distortion can cause the following, straight lines can appear curved, Buildings can appear warped or leaning. Objects or people at the edges of photos can appear bigger or more stretched out than they are. Um, it can change how your face appears in selfies versus in regular photos or even vertical selfies versus horizontal selfies. The lens being off to the side can, uh, it doesn't really matter if you're taking a photo of something far away, but it does matter in close-ups. Um, you notice this if you're taking a group photo of a bunch of people and some people look at the screen versus if they look they know that the lens is off to the side so they look to where the actual camera lens is and so people's eyes are all pointing in different directions so in this example i'm going to point around again here so this is the original photo uh, that i took of this sign and you can see how the barrel distortion makes this sign look like it's leaning forward and then i used an app adjustment to fix the barrel distortion to make it straight again. And there is a bonus activity that shows you how to do that. If you're taking photos of something, you may need to change the orientation of your camera or adjust how you're holding the camera or your phone or where, change the placement of where something is in the screen in order to make sure that it's not an issue but it's something to be aware of when you're taking photos with a smartphone. Be cautious with filters and editing. Some settings will push the image so far that you lose details. For instance, too much contrast or exposure may result in blowing out the highlights and result in a loss of detail in the whites. You can easily end up with solid blocks of unnatural color instead of realistic gradients. Photos can start to look gimmicky. This can be fun or maybe an intended look for a particular project, but it's generally not a good practice to apply across all of your images. There is a, um, a take-home sheet that has a list of free apps to try out for Android and Apple phones. Some things to remember as you go out and take photos. Don't trample delicate nature to get a photo. Stay off of private property. Put your phone away during things like wedding ceremonies and let the happy couple look around and see your faces instead of the back of your phone because that's, you know, that's what they paid a professional photographer. Be mindful of cultural etiquette. Some ceremonies or artifacts are forbidden to have photographed um, in cultures and religions. So keep that in mind. Ask permission if you're not sure. Don't miss out on being present for things and remember to print your photos. There is a lesson plan. If you're watching this video, you've already got access to it. Feel free to work through the handouts and practice. And as always, we are available to answer your questions. So drop us an email if you have any, and we're happy to chat.